Guess what? Manifest is on right now. And we're here in Israel with the partners of our ministry. Uh, this is part two. I seldom do a part one and a part two, but th we had to do a part two on this. So you'll know where I'm at. I am at Tel Dan, and behind me is the oldest gate in the world that dates back to Abraham's time. Directly in front of me, we're headed there, is my favorite place in the whole country, Nimrod's Fortress. And it wasn't built by Nimrod. They just call it that. But we're headed there in a minute. So we want to get right into this teaching, and I want to uh, share with you that the theme has been to understand a little bit more about why I lean toward the pre-tribulation coming of the Lord. Now, let me say this. I do not argue or debate. I will listen to other people's view, try to glean from that. I want them to listen to my view, and I present the information to you, and it's something that you have to determine because can I say something to you, whether you're pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib, it doesn't determine your salvation. Amen. And anything that does not determine our salvation or the outcome of our salvation should not be argued about. We can have fun talking about it. We can, But I get letters from people because I'm pre-trib, or I even use the word rapture, and these are Christian people that just blast me and call me a heretic and I do not believe that Jesus will ever rebuke me in heaven for telling people, live right and repent, Jesus is coming. Amen. You know, I mean, do you think Amen. he's going to rebuke me? I can't believe you told people to do that, Harry. Why did you teach people that? I don't think he's going to rebuke me for, for telling people that he's coming one day. Now, in Matthew chapter 24, I'm going to give you a verse that many individuals that believe in, in post-trib, that is that Jesus will return at the end of the seven-year tribulation. This is one of their strong verses that they emphasize. And it says this, And he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet to gather, to gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Now, the basic interpretation by those who believe in post-trib is that the elect here is the church. And I remember he was he's a very fine man. He's a great man of God. But we were debating on one of the major Christian networks, and his emphasis was this, and I began to share the different meanings of the word elect. Now, before I do that, I want to present something to you that is very, very, very interesting. If we were to say that Jesus returns at post-trib, and as he returns to the earth and steps foot, Zechariah 14, on the Mount of Olives, that he sends angels to the north, south, east, and west to gather the Christians that have survived the tribulation to him in Jerusalem, we have a major problem that most of them have never thought about with post-trib. Post-trib does not just teach that Jesus is coming back to earth. It teaches that we have to have a resurrection of the dead, which is correct, that we who are alive and remain have to be caught up to meet him in the air. So if I can say it, basically the dead are raised, the living are changed, and we meet him in the air and then turn around and come back. Here's the question. If we are the elect being gathered together from the four winds of heaven, to, to uh, and on the earth, now, not, not in heaven. He has come back. Read Matthew 24. He has come back to the earth, then sends the angels together. Then how was that possible when we're in the air meeting him? That's, you're a little slow. You're a little slow. Because if we meet him in the air, we have already been raised and we've already met him. But then post-trib says that we're all, we are on earth. He comes to the earth and gathers the elect. Can I just say it? Can't have it both ways. That's right. Either we're on earth and suddenly changed, and we're on earth and the dead have been raised standing beside me. Then what do I do with Paul's statement when he says, The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the shout, the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. We who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the cloud to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. So there's a little bit of a contradiction here between the belief and the idea of what some of the New Testament teaches about we have to go up and we have to meet him. And then he said in John 14, in my father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not true, I would have told you, I go prepare a place for you. And if I go prepare a place for you, I will come again. Now watch the wording and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be. There has to be a trip to heaven. There has to be a trip where we go into heaven, as we mentioned last week, to the marriage supper and to the Bema. Now, what I'd like to do here is give you uh, some scriptures. Let's go to, I, well, let's go, I, I'm, I, like I'm preaching in a church. Let's just open your Bible right here to Isaiah chapter 27, verse 13. It should come to pass in that day that with the great trumpet, 
that the great trumpet, which is a shofar, of course, shall be blown, and they shall come which were ready to perish in the land of Assyria, the outcast in the land of Egypt, and shall worship the Lord in the holy mountain at Jerusalem. Now look at Isaiah chapter 10, 20 through 23. It shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and such as have escaped from the house of Jacob will never again depend upon him who defeated them, but will depend on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel in truth. The remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, the mighty God, for through your people, O Israel, for though your people, O Israel, be as the sand of the sea, a remnant of them will return. The destruction decreed, now watch, this is the tribulation. The destruction decreed shall overflow with righteousness, for the Lord of hosts will make a determined end. That's the end of the tribulation now in the, in the midst of the land. When it talks about gathering the elect from the four corners, there's your verses. That's what Jesus is talking about. That's the, re it's the remnant of Jewish people who have been in the north, south, east, and west in the earth that he is bringing back to his nation to meet him as their Messiah. Amen. That's what it's talking about. You can go ahead and clap. I feel, I feel a little clap coming on. I feel a little clap coming on. <laughs> now, what about the elect? Let me read the verse again. It says this, He shall gather, he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Now, those who believe in post-trib will say that the elect is the church. However, I want to go into the scripture and show you the places where the elect is mentioned. All right? This is Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 1. The elect, the elect can be a prophet. There are prophets who were called God's elect. Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 4, Israel is called God's elect. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 21, angels are called God's elect. Isn't that interesting? The elect angels is what it says. Titus chapter 1 and verse 1, the elect can be believers. The elect can be an individual. Uh, John wrote in uh, 2 John chapter, 2 John 1, unto the elect lady. So it's a woman who's called the elect in the New Testament. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 6, the elect is called the Messiah. Now, see, the, 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 the reason I'm sharing that with you is because there are different meanings of the word elect. It can be, again, it can be the Messiah, it can be a prophet, it can be an angel, it can be Israel, it can be an individual believer, it can be the church. So what you have to do is you have to determine the setting of that verse and the context of that verse and who that verse is addressed to, to determine who the elect actually is. So to say that the elect that are gathered from the north, south, east, and west at the end of the tribulation is the church well, that sounds good, but when Jesus spoke that, the church didn't even exist. Hello? It, I mean, it didn't even exist. He was speaking to a Jewish audience, and they would have understood the prophecies, and I just read two of them to you, where the elect is a remnant that when the decree of destruction ends, the Lord brings them back to the nation of Israel, where he is going to set up his kingdom and rule and reign from. So to use Matthew 24 and the elect verse as a verse that identifies the tribulation and the church, it just is not good hermeneutics or good interpretation of scripture. Now, I want you to notice this because post-trib says basically that there's just a and I'm not mocking when I say this, but it basically says, okay, there has to be a resurrection of the dead in Christ. There has to be a change in those of us who are living from mortal to immortality. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, 17. So we know that. So, so it, this would mean that we would just kind of go up and do a U-turn and come back. But I want to show you what the prophets of the Bible and what the scripture itself has to say about this issue. Now notice these verses. Revelation chapter 19, verse 14. And the armies which were in heaven followed Christ upon white horses. White, who is going to be riding the white horses? Can I say something? Angels don't ride horses. Every time an angel shows up, Daniel didn't see Gabriel with his horse. Gabriel showed up. Michael showed up as Michael. Angels transport themselves without any kind of a transportation needed in, the, in, in that realm. Jesus is on a white horse, and it is the saints on white horses. Now, how do we know that? How do we know that's the saints coming back from heaven to earth with him? Because Jude 14 says this, Behold, the Lord cometh with, with if I say with, with. 
the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon the earth. He's coming back with his saints. Well, if he's coming back with us, where in the world are we? We're in heaven, not on the earth. We're in heaven. Ah, this is good preaching. Thank you. We're going to take up an offering when this is over. No, we're not really. No, we're not. We're not. Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 5. Now, listen, here's an Old Testament prophet. Look at this. The Lord God shall come and all the saints with thee. Folks, it's right there that when the Lord comes, when the Messiah comes back, he comes back and we are with him. So when he comes back in the rapture, he comes back for us. When he comes back at the second coming, he comes back with us. And it's very clear. You see, a lot of times, let me just say this. A lot of times when people look at a scripture or they go to interpret a scripture, they will interpret it based on uh, what I call solo interpretation, meaning they look at the verse as it is, and then they want to interpret it based on their theory. So they, they, build, not, they build the verse around their theory. Okay, instead of doing what the Bible said in Isaiah, line on line, precept on precept, here a little, there a little. In other words, when you're, when you're dealing with prophecy especially, you don't just pull a verse out and say, I think this is what it means. You have to do the line on line, precept on precept, here a little, there a little. And that's how you build any doctrine. You cannot build any theologian. I've, been, I've, I've taken Bible courses and, you know, from scholars and theologians. I've got 25,000 books. Trust me, I've not read all of them. <laughs> But in other words, I have resources that I can pull from at any given moment. And I can tell you that when it comes to biblical interpretation, even, even, even Peter said the scripture is not of private interpretation. You have to compare scripture with scripture. And I don't know why I'm saying all of that, but maybe this will help you. Now, this is something I felt like that the Holy Spirit gave me, and I've got to share this with you. And uh, my friend, and like I said, he's going to be on the second trip. He's going to watch these programs, but I'm not going to tell you who he is. He's a board member, and we, 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 like to, we like to debate back and forth on these, these things, these different theories. When I told him this, he looked at me and he said, now you have just told me the greatest evidence of pre-trib I've ever heard, and nobody's ever said that. I've never seen that before. I was uh, studying the seven festivals of Israel, and I'm gonna go through these real quick. This is the order, three in the spring, one in the summer, three in the fall. You have Passover followed by unleavened bread followed by first fruits. Then you have a gap of a period of time and you come to early summer to Pentecost. Then you have about four months and you come to the seventh month on the Jewish calendar, which are the, the three fall festivals. And the order is trumpets, 10 days later, the day of atonement, five days later, tabernacles. Now here is something I absolutely have to make clear to everybody here and everybody watching me. It is absolutely impossible to throw those feasts out of order. And the reason is they are a prophetic picture of events which will happen in the future. For example, you do not have Pentecost first and Passover four months later. You know why? Because Pentecost was the coming of the Holy Spirit and Passover was redemption and you can't be filled with the Holy Spirit first and then be saved. That's right. That's right. Amen. You are first saved and then filled with the Spirit. Yes. Repent and be baptized, and then you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Everybody tracking with me yes. so far? Yes. It's, it, it is impossible. Now, this is really important. It is impossible to throw atonement before trumpets. God, in other words, every year God said, celebrate this on the first month, celebrate this one on the fourth month, celebrate these three on the seventh month. You cannot throw them off. Here's why. If you throw them off, you throw off God's pattern of prophecy. Because God has established everything by pattern. You've got sun, moon, and stars. The sun determines the day, the moon determines the month, and the stars determine the cycles of the year in the ancient time. You have body, soul, and spirit. You have outer court, inner court, and holy of holies. You have to go into the tabernacle or the temple first by coming through the outer, then the inner, and then past the veil to the holies. You can't switch them. You just cannot go into the temple or tabernacle and just jump into the holy place. It's not in front of you. It's a, everybody say, everybody say this. It is a process. Say it. It, it is, is a process. process. It's all process. Now here's my point. Watch, watch the future. Here, let's go, let's go to the three fall festivals. Now what I'm talking about is post-trib, that if Jesus returns for the church at the end of the tribulation, 
it messes up all of the pattern of the three fall festivals. Jesus died at Passover. He was in the tomb at Unleavened Bread. He was seen alive, actually first fruits, uh, it was the Feast of Unleavened Bread actually, but during first fruits, he's alive. The disciples see him alive. At Pentecost is the birth of the church. Now, in the future, we've got three left. Now, atonement had a partial fulfillment with Jesus suffering, but it wasn't all fulfilled. Watch this. Trumpets is the only festival in the Old Testament that only has two verses to it and doesn't even tell you what it is. It just says, get up and blow trumpets. <laughs> Have a celebration, blow trumpets, don't do any work. And then it's, it's like, so it's one of those festivals, can I say it, that's a mystery. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in the moment of twinkling of the eye at the sound of the last trump. Whoa. So trumpets is a picture of the rapture. And I can prove that to you because in the, old, in, in the time of Christ and even before, before we kept calendars, the, uh, the festivals would fall on certain months, but you only could determine the month with the silver sliver of the moon. For example, the month began when two witnesses would see the silver sliver of the moon and they would go to Jerusalem to the Sanhedrin to the high priest and they'd say, we have seen the moon reborn or sanctified and then they would declare the month. And then on top of Mount Scopus, which is the mountain beside the Mount of Olives, they built a fire and they built fires on all these high mountains. And when you saw the fire burning, Jews in Lebanon, Jews in Syria, Jews in Babylon knew that the new month was beginning or if it was a festival, that the festival's time had come. Of course, most of the festival time, you could tell by the full moon. Passover was at a full moon. Uh, Tabernacles is the, is the 15th of the month, so it's a full moon. And they did it by the moon, not by a regular calendar. This is how they knew. So my point is this, and I don't want you to miss this. You have trumpets. Then, then comes atonement. What is atonement? That was the day when God determined the outcome of a person's spiritual destiny. Three groups of people, the Jews teach this to this day. On the day of atonement, you had the totally righteous, the totally unrighteous, and the in-between. The totally righteous, their names would be sealed in the book of life. The totally unrighteous had to repent if their name was in the book, and if they did not repent, they were lost. The in-between, who were kind of one foot in, one foot out, had to determine, are you in or are you out? And this is what happened on the Day of Atonement. It was about judgment if you didn't repent. So in other words, that's the tribulation period. Because I can take you to the book of Revelation and I can show you the total righteous. That's the 144,000 sealed with the seal of God. I can show you the totally unrighteous. Those are the men that three times in the book of Revelation, it tells you men repented not. They're taking the mark, they're doomed. Then there's the in-between who have to determine, do you take the mark or do you not take the mark? You see what I'm saying? So the three that you see, the three that you see on the Day of Atonement are the same three that you see in the tribulation period. But at the end of the tribulation comes what? Millennial Kingdom, which is Tabernacles. Because Tabernacles is the one festival that all Jews and Gentiles can celebrate together. And tabernacles, even in the early church, is a picture of the kingdom. Do you remember when Moses and Elijah appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration? Moses represented those that had died. Elijah represented those who hadn't died. Because how many of you know Elijah got caught up alive? Yes. And Moses died and God buried him. So there's two groups. There's the dead in Christ. All right, that's Moses, that, re that represents Moses, but there's those who have never died. That's the, those of us who are alive and remain at the coming of the Lord. And what did, what, did, what did Peter say? Let us build three tabernacles. Now the Bible says booths, but it's tabernacles because they believed that the resurrection and the kingdom, the kingdom was connected to tabernacles. So let's go over it again. Here's what's coming. You got trumpets, atonement, and tabernacles. If you put, if you put the rapture anywhere in the tribulation, you have thrown atonement ahead of trumpets. If, if I put, if I put, if I put, if I put the judgment of the tribulation anywhere before the trumpets, then I have, I have messed the pattern of God up. Not my pattern, the pattern of, of, of God. And so the point is that next on line is the sounding of the trumpet, which is the rapture, then followed by the tribulation, followed by the end of the tribulation, the kingdom where the Messiah comes back to rule and reign for a thousand years. See what I'm saying?